Hi everyone, Mr. Fitzpatrick here to talk to you about the Church in the Middle Ages. The Roman Catholic Church had great influence during the Middle Ages. It was the center of every village and town. It played an important role in the political life of the period. At times, it even had the power of life or death over people. Before we get started, let's take a look at our objectives for this lesson. I want to you guys to be able to discuss how the Roman Catholic Church influenced life during the Middle Ages. I want you to be able to summarize attempts to reform the church. I want you to be able to describe education during the Middle Ages, explain why the Crusades took place and the effects of the Crusades, and then finally we'll watch a little video so that you can distinguish the difference between Romanesque and Gothic architecture. If you take a look at this drawing, you can see a bunch of different buildings within this little village. Which is the largest building in this village? I know you look, some of them look a little bit bigger, but that's probably because it's closer. But really, this is the biggest building. As you can see right here, there's a cross on it. This is the church. In villages and towns, back during the Middle Ages, the church would have always been the biggest building within the town. And that still holds true today for many small towns in America, if you think about it. Think about Newtown. You've got St. Andrews and some of the other different churches. Same thing in Richboro. Even all of the important ceremonies of the time, like to become a knight or the act of homage, they were part of religious ceremonies. Now, during this time period, most of the holidays revolved around religious uh, ceremonies as well. For instance, you take a look in January, you see the 12th night religious festival. Take a look in February, you have St. Valentine's Day. We have Valentine's Day today. In March, you have Easter. You take a look down at July, we have St. Swithin's Day, and so on and so forth. If we made our way all the way through to, say, December, and you'll see down the bottom there, Christmas celebrations, and we know that Christmas is a religious holiday. Some other rules that were followed inside of these villages during this time period would have been no meat on Fridays or you must attend mass or service on Sundays. Much of this holds true today. During Lent we don't really eat meat on Friday. Some people don't eat meat on any Friday. And we attend mass or service on Sundays. The schools were ran by the clergy, church leaders. They ran the schools, they ran the hospitals. Monks and nuns provided food and shelter for travelers, while priests recorded births, and they performed marriages and conducted burials. Now, politically, the church and the government were basically one and the same. The church helped to govern. Church officials were advisors to the king, and the church officials would say, hey, everyone must obey the king's laws, unless they go against church laws, and the name for church laws was canon laws, and it still is today. Now, the Inquisition um, was one way that the church tried to face head-on the problem of heresy. All right. Heresy was when someone went against the teachings or beliefs of the church. So what they would do is they would call you to court. And if you admitted to being a heretic, then sometimes you were just slapped with a fine or put in prison. But if you did not, you were often tortured and usually put to death. As you can see here, burning at the stake. And here's a mass burial. This is an early Inquisition, and we'll see an even greater Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, during the 1400s. Now, the church had something called a teeth. If you remember when we 
studied Islam, 2.5% was donated to the poor. Well, in the Catholic Church, it was expected that people gave 10% of what they made to the church. Well, 10% over time is a lot of money. The church grew to become quite rich. Now, if you had a church official who died, what would often happen would, was that someone would, whoever had the most money, could basically buy that position, buy the position of bishop, all right? And it became very, very corrupt. Now, some people wanted to fix that. One of the attempts to reform the church were monks, specifically the monks of Cluny. They lived by these strict set of rules. The monks there led simple lives, spending much of their time in prayer. They, they soon won the respect of the people. The monks of Cluny recognized only the authority of the Pope, and they said that the church, not kings or nobles, should choose these church leaders. Another person that tried to reform the church was Pope Gregory. He wanted to rid the church of control by the kings and nobles and increase the pope's power over church officials. So to reach these goals, Gregory made many changes. Church leaders who bought or sold church offices were removed. And bishops and priests were now forbidden to marry. Still like that today. Finally, there are these guys called friars. They're kind of like monks, but monks stayed in monasteries and prayed. Friars traveled from town to town to preach. Okay, now we're going to take a little peek at learning during this time. As we said, it was the church that ran these schools. They were called cathedral schools. Today, we have a lot of Catholic schools and a lot of uh, private schools. Think of thing, things that come to mind like Archbishop Wood and St. Joe's Prep, um, Gwynedd Mercy College or University. A lot of these schools are still run by the church. But as these students finished these cathedral schools, students wanted to continue learning. So they would form what were called unions. They were teacher-student groups who wanted to further their education. So education that went beyond the cathedral school. So think about this. What were these unions the birth of? Take a look at those first three letters. U-N-I. Did you get it? Universities. Penn State University, Princeton University, and all the other universities across the United States and across the world. All right, now, speaking of learning, that brings us to Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas believed, uh, there, there was a major argument, you know, well, do I have faith, which is religion, or do I have reason, believe in reason, which is science? And you could see this argument. Do you just believe in what's told to you, or do you believe in what people find and research and, and experiment with? And people of the church said, whoa, 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 you know, science is no good. I have faith. I believe in the Bible. I, you know. So there was a major argument during this time period. And it was Thomas Aquinas who said, wait, wait, faith and reason are both gifts of God. Reason helps people to know what the world is really like, while faith reveals religious truths and helps people to find their way to heaven. So he took the two and he kind of married them together and said it's okay to believe in both. Now we're going to take a look at some famous people here and what they said about this. Tell me what you think. Are they pro-faith? Are they pro-reason? Or are they a combination? Benjamin Franklin. The way to see by faith is to shut the eye of reason. So, think about Ben Franklin and what you know about Ben Franklin. He was a scientist, so obviously he's saying, you know, if you want to just live by faith, that's fine, but you, you're completely eliminating reason. How about Gandhi? Faith must be enforced by reason, 
When faith becomes blind, it dies. Hmm. So he's more like Thomas Aquinas saying, you know, there's definitely a blending of the two. Both are extremely necessary. How about Martin Luther, who we will study soon? Reason is the greatest enemy that faith has. It never comes to the aid of spiritual things, but more frequently than not, struggles against the divine word, treating with contempt all that emanates from God. Well, as you'll see, Martin Luther is a very spiritual man, and he is pro-faith. Martin Luther started the Lutheran Church. And then, as you can sometimes see it today, on signs right outside of churches, reason is the greatest enemy that faith has. Now we're going to take a look at the Crusades. Okay. The Crusades were basically a series of wars from the people over here in Western Europe with the Muslims. And you can see Seljuk right here. Remember that word Seljuk? The Seljuk Turks. They are going to take over Jerusalem, which is right here. They're going to forbid people from coming here. Pilgrims, Christians, Jews, no more. This is a Muslim city. You're not allowed to come here anymore on your religious journeys. All right, now, not far from there is the Byzantine Emperor Alexius, and he's getting a little nervous. These Seljuk Turks are making him nervous. He says, hey, Pope Urban II, will you please send me your best 100 to 200 knights? These Seljuk Turks are making me nervous. All right, we go back over to the west. Here's Pope Urban II. Knights? Nah. I'm going to invite anyone and everyone who wants to go to Byzantine to go on crusade and help take back Jerusalem. Attention all Christians. Go kill Muslims and gain access into heaven. This is an example of religious extremism. Oh, back over here. Alexius. What are all these peasants doing here? And I have to feed them? What did that stupid Pope do? I am so mad. Obviously, I'm just paraphrasing what Emperor Alexius might have said. Let's take a look at some notable dates and events. So in 1099, the Crusaders take back Jerusalem. Just short of 100 years later, Saladin, a Muslim, he retakes Jerusalem. Well, now we have the Third Crusade, the King's Crusade. Let's see what kings are involved. First, we have the German king, Frederick Barbarossa. However, during this trip, he drowns. Some say he was trying to take a bath in the river, but he drowns, leaving now just two kings. Two kings who really didn't like each other. Shocker. The French king, Philip II, and the English king, Richard the Lionheart. Well, Philip says, you know what, Richard? You go by yourself. I'm out. And Philip goes back to France. And what does he do? He starts attacking Richard's land. Why, he's not there. Sneaky. Saladin and Richard the Lionheart go back and forth for many years, actually gain, uh, gaining admiration for each other. All right, And that really kind of ends in failure for Richard the Lionheart. He spends most of his time as king on crusade. In 1202, there's the Knight's Crusade. And in 1212, the Children's Crusade. That one was pretty miserable as the children stepped on the ship. Many of the people just enslaved them, and they never even made it. And in 1291, the Muslims officially win the Crusades. As you can see in these three pictures, the emblem for the Crusaders is generally the Red Cross. Sometimes it's red here with a white cross in the middle. All right, the effects of the Crusades. First of all, the Great Schism, the split in the church, became permanent. Done. The East and the West done. They're going to stay split. Feudalism begins to break down. Interest in learning in the West grows, so people became, become interested in attending schools. And after the Crusades, people in the West wanted the things that they encountered while on Crusade, such as spices, silk, and soap. Well, where there's a desire to have things, there's a market. So, trade routes develop and new towns develop. Now we start to see cities all over the western part of Europe, right over into the eastern part of Europe, begin to grow because people need places to go to trade their goods. Okay, that just about does it. Now I just want you to go and click on the video that's going to compare Romanesque to Gothic architecture. Have a great day.